Sitting in the grace and the mercy and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ as we are back into the lectionary readings for one Sunday. This next Sunday we will begin our stewardship emphasis for three Sundays. Today the text for this message is from 1st, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 1 through 13 and reads as follows. St. Paul says to this Timothy, this young pastor, you therefore my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. The word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things, for the sake of those who are chosen, so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot deny himself. Here's the text. Please join me now. Father, we look at these words of Paul to Timothy, asking, O Lord, for your spirit to open our hearts to understand this counsel. Not only to understand it, but to live it. So that we, O Lord, may bring others to the truth of the gospel. That they too may be eternal brothers and sisters in the family of God. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, as we look at this reading today, I guess the question one can ask is, can we learn anything from a conversation between a veteran pastor and a rookie pastor? The picture that is before you is a picture of Paul ordaining Timothy into the ministry. And I'm sure that Timothy looked up to his mentor. Word had gotten to Timothy what was happening to his mentor. Paul was now in jail. He may even be executed or martyred for the faith. Timothy is just young. He's just starting out. He's probably scratching himself in the head and is concerned for the future of the church, thinking... What will be the future of the church without Paul? Will it survive? If this is left up to me, God help me, because I am not Paul. You get a hint of this concern from this letter Paul writes to Timothy. Because Paul is in jail. The future of the church may look bleak indeed. Can we find anything useful for our lives today? from his correspondence between this veteran preacher and this rookie? Well, let's take a look again at these words of counsel Paul shares. Paul encourages Timothy to keep his chin up. He asked that Timothy joins with him in solidarity and suffering. He tells Timothy, do not look upon suffering as a liability to the faith. How about that? Look at suffering as an asset to the faith. That kind of goes against our brain, doesn't it? When we suffer and experience hardship, we want to throw in the towel like Timothy. Paul says, no, don't do that. Understand that in suffering, God is bringing out good things. 
He only had to point to one thing to show this to be true. The cross. Did not God accomplish salvation through suffering and death? If he can do such marvelous things through suffering, just imagine what he can bring to you through suffering. Don't always go with the idea that suffering is a liability to your faith. It may be a blessing. It's not law. It's gospel. Hang in there. Experience solidarity with me, Timothy. This is what happens when you bring the gospel to the world. The world rejects us. It's going to cause us to suffer. And so when it does happen, it kind of indicates we're doing our job. God will work through that. So he tells Timothy to be a good soldier. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He uses these metaphors to speak to Timothy's heart and hopefully to ours. Paul says that the metaphor of the soldier is if he's going to be effective, he must disentangle himself from all everyday affairs of the life. He's got one task to do. And if he dis gets distracted from that task, that destroys and weakens his effectiveness. Stay focused, Timothy, through this, please. God's got good things for us. Seek, Timothy, to please the one who enlisted you in the faith. And I'm not speaking about myself, Paul says. I'm speaking about Christ. He enlisted you as a soldier, disentangled you from all these concerns and worries you have when you look around this world. And man, we have a lot of them today, don't we? <clears throat> what's going on with our economy? What's going on with our country? What's going on with our world? Stay focused, Timothy! Stay focused. Be a good soldier. Seek to please the one who enlisted you in this ministry. Paul then goes to another metaphor. He says... If anyone competes as an athlete, it is not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Which means, Timothy, I know it's hard for you sometimes to go out in this world that just rejects you. And maybe if you twist the rules a little bit about the gospel, maybe if you remove this from the scriptures or you alter this from the Bible, maybe the world will like you a little bit better. But you're not competing to the rules when you do that. You're cheating. You don't win the prize when you don't stay true to the rules. That's just the way it is in sports. It is the same with the scriptures. This past week I had an interesting conversation with a young man in his 20s. He shared with me he was becoming disheartened with the church. Conversation went on to share with me that the point of his disheartening was he was going to all these churches and he never really is getting the sense that they were staying true to the gospel. That they were altering things. They were trying to make things more accommodational to the world. That bothered him. Why? Because in the end, this was his conclusion. They're more concerned about numbers and money than they are concerned about my soul. I'm having a hard time finding myself a church now. You see, you don't win the prize if you don't compete to the rules. If you try to change and alter them so that you're going to be more acceptable to the world, it's not going to be effective. It's not going to work. And we'll have more of these people that I talked to this week who are disheartened with the church because they don't seem to be concerned about people. They're concerned about making sure they get people in and make sure they have the offerings up. You compete in your life. Compete according to the rules. And the other metaphor that St. Paul encourages Timothy with is the farmer. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. 
Paul tells Timothy, this is a trustworthy saying. It's a noble task if you desire to be a pastor. There are a lot of rewards, heartaches that come with the ministry. A lot of rewards. The greatest reward in the ministry, in my opinion, been in it for some 30 some years, is gratitude. It is so heartwarming to hear people just say, thank you. Ray Boltz had a song titled Thank You some years ago. Contemporary song, and it's kind of phrased in that way. Thank you for giving to the Lord. Praise about how one person was a Sunday school teacher, and they meet this individual in heaven who says, thank you for giving to the Lord. I was a child of eight when you had that prayer, and Jesus came into my heart. Thank you. I am a life that has been changed. So St. Paul says, it is a noble task, and there are rewards of gratitude to be experienced in heaven, that when you look around there, people will say to you, because of you, I'm a life that's been changed. That just brings a sense of warmth to any heart, any witness, not just pastors, to hear gratitude, because of you, I am a life that has been changed. It is a trustworthy saying, Paul tells Timothy, that this is a noble task to pursue the office of the ministry. Paul has many trustworthy sayings throughout his writings to Timothy and the other young pastor, Titus. And a few of them are very encouraging for us. What's really great about trustworthy sayings is this. You can count on them, right? They're not ever going to let you down. You can count on them. Paul has five trustworthy sayings. Five things you can count on as a fact. Four of them he gives to Timothy. One he gives to Titus. One of the four he gives to Timothy is this. This is a trustworthy saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners who, among whom I am foremost of all. Amen, Paul. Amen. Christ came to save us. And you and I may challenge Paul on the chief of sinners, right? Maybe we think we deserve the title. But regardless, gratitude. God did not abandon us to the condemnation of our sin. He sent Jesus. And because of Christ, we are a life that have been changed. And in his letter to Timothy here in the second epistle, he says, this is a trustworthy statement about this, that if we died with him, we will also live with him. Have we died with Christ? Because it's a trustworthy saying, if you've died with Christ, you live with him. Have you died with Christ? Notice the past tense. It's not like St. Paul is telling Timothy, if I'm martyred in the future, I will live with Christ. If we, if we die with him, no, he says, if we die, past tense, think about it. Any verse comes to mind for you today? Where you've died with Jesus? May I read Romans 6 to you this morning? Romans chapter 6. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead, from the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. You've been baptized. You died with Jesus. This is a trustworthy saying. If you died with Christ, you live with Christ. Have we died with Christ? Yes, we have. Doesn't that bring a sense of peace and comfort to you in your life? To know that you, because of baptism, will live with Christ. Timothy goes on. I mean, Paul continues to encourage Timothy with those words. That just now hang in there. If we endure, we will also reign with him. 
But be careful not to deny you and doubt him. That's, that's understandable. We, we, we're going to have our problems with doubts. Back in the fall, in Adam and Eve, Eve doubted God's word, but that wasn't the sin. The doubt was not the sin. The rebellion was the sin. So if you have doubts, don't worry about that. We all do. It's not going to condemn us with our doubts, but when we deny, now that's a problem. If we deny him, he will also deny us. But Paul ends this with great gospel. He says, if we are faithless, he still remains faithful. So yes, there may be times in our life, maybe a lot of times in our life, we're faithless with God. We don't hang in like we should. We rebel against him. We don't honor the commandments like children of God should. Even though we're faithless, Paul has this wonderful word, God remains faithful. Which means what? That he's going to be faithful to forgiveness. I have promised you forgiveness through the blood of my son, Jesus Christ. So if you're faithless and you repent and come to me for forgiveness, you got it. Didn't we hear that in the gospel today? Disciples were like scratching their heads with that one too, right? If your brother sins against you, you rebuke him, repent, you forgive him. And if he does it seven times, you forgive him seven times. It's like, oh man, how many times do I need to be taken advantage of? Jesus? Really? And that's why the disciples say what they say after Jesus says, forgive them all the time. He tells us, oh, we'll increase our faith because right now, that's impossible. We have only so much limit with our patience. You see, God doesn't. God's patience is unlimitless. That's where God wants us to be as well with our neighbor. By the power of the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, He can get us there. Though we may be faithless, it will not cause God to be faithless to us. He will always be faithful to His promises to welcome back the repentant sinner. Just like He welcomed back that prodigal son. You see, there's a lot of good things here for us as Christians today, right? In this letter between Paul and this young pastor, Timothy, you don't just have to be a pastor to find blessings in this letter. These blessings are for all believers in Christ. In his name, amen. amen. Now, may the peace of God which confesses all our sinning, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We receive our Lord.